don't believe in ghosts, but I have experienced something strange in my life just once. It happened four years ago. I was living in Kobe and working for a security firm. I was working the night shift during Obon when we got a call. There's something strange with the entrance auto lock at this newly constructed building. My partner and I rushed over. Was there a thief? I wondered. But when we checked it out, there were no signs of foul play. According to the residents, the door opened of its own accord. Thinking it was just a fault in the mechanism that controls the lock, I went to investigate it. However, there was nothing wrong with it. I wondered whether I should call the electric company when suddenly there was a noise behind us. When we turned around, the door was open, even though no one was there. Both my partner and I were shocked, and then the machine started going beep, beep, beep. Hey, take a look, my partner said. The console for the auto lock showed three, zero, two. I got chills. There was nobody there but us. A few days later, I became curious about who lived in 302. I checked it out, but nobody lived there. However, a little while later, my partner told me something. He knew the person who used to live there. He died during an earthquake when the apartment he was living in collapsed. So, perhaps during Obon, he was feeling nostalgic and had come to visit his old apartment, he said. Hey guys, I'm your host, Tara A. Devlin, and welcome to another episode of Kowabana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. This week's episode is an Obon special. If you've never heard of Obon before, it's a Japanese Buddhist festival that generally starts on the 13th of August each year and ends on the 16th, with the 15th being the main day of celebration. It's somewhat similar to the Ghost Festival in China, or Day of the Dead in Mexico, and it's a time to honour one's ancestors. People from all over the country travel back to their childhood home and have family reunions, they visit and clean their ancestors' graves, and the spirits are thought to visit the family household during this time. Obon is a popular holiday for creepy pastors for this very reason, as it gives a legitimate reason to have ghosts hanging around. Our first episode for this week looks at a family that has two family altars, and the horrible secret behind why. This one's called Why My Family Has Two Altars. There are two altars in my relative's house. The one on the left is for my grandfather, and the one on the right is for his nephew, who died at a young age. The strange thing is, though, that when we visit for Obon, the door to the altar on the right is always closed. I wanted to know why they had two altars when they're so big and bulky, so I asked my relative, and she told me. My grandfather was an active firefighter. He loved helping people and would go out of his way to do so. In a way, you could say he was kind of the good kind of busybody. He had a niece and a nephew that he loved dearly, and he often took them to a nearby river to play. Perhaps it was because a lot of rain fell upstream, but suddenly the waters rose, and his niece nearly drowned. He jumped in to save her, and was able to safely reach the other side of the bank. While his niece and her family were happy, his nephew pestered him. What about me? 
With a smile, he said, If I happen to be there at the right time, I'll save you too, and patted him on the head. A few years later, his nephew got trapped in some deep water in the river. My grandfather, who was there with him, told his niece to get help and jumped into the water. He rushed to save him, but he was getting on in years. Even though he managed to reach his nephew, he couldn't keep holding him up, and he drowned. His nephew was saved by some other people. While the family was happy he was saved, they mourned my grandfather's death. His nephew, however, showed no signs of being particularly sad. As he got older, he even started to dislike welcoming him for Obon. His parents scolded him, but he retorted sharply, It's his own fault for being too weak and dying. After that, they continued without him, but shortly thereafter, the nephew also died. He was late returning from school one day, so they went out to find him. He was on the river bank alone, facing the water, smiling cheerfully. Even slapping him across the face did nothing. He just kept on smiling and laughing. After he was hospitalized, he did a complete 180 degree turn and lost all emotion. He stopped eating, and within half a year, he passed away. After that, his mortuary tablet was placed next to my grandfather's, but come the morning, they would find it lying on the tatami mats. They also frequently heard the sounds of banging coming from the altar room. They went to see a monk about it, and he suggested they separate the altars. But it's Obon. The least you could do is open his altar doors, I said. But when I did, my relative just faintly smiled and said, I don't want to light any incense sticks for my brother at the same time. Obon will be here again soon. More than their half-hearted attempts at maintaining the family altars after death, I'm more scared of the family themselves. Most Japanese houses have a small wooden cabinet that acts as an altar to pray to the family members who have passed on. These are called butsudan, and are often small enough to fit into a living or bedroom. But some houses are large enough that occasionally they even have a butsuma, which is an entire room dedicated to Buddhist images. During Obon, families will light incense at the family altar and leave offerings for the deceased. This is generally in the form of fruit and vegetables, but it can take other forms too, like in this next story. This one's called My Competitive Dead Mother. This story happened when I went home for Obon. I put down my parents' favorite things while alive on their altar and went to bed. That night, they appeared by my pillow. It had become a custom at Obon, so I wasn't scared. I'd just always say, Ah, welcome back. They'd smile and then disappear. It was always this way. But this year, my father had a strange expression on his face. My mother kept prodding him with her elbow. Like she wanted him to say something. I looked at them for a bit, but it didn't seem like they were going anywhere. And as my mother kept hitting him, I took pity and asked, Is there something you want to say? He opened his mouth. Ah,、oh, I'm gonna cry. Ah,、oh, so agitated. 
Oh, I'm embarrassed. But your mother keeps poking me. He went on like this for about 10 minutes. It started to piss me off. Dad, if you can't say it, then Mum should. After she elbowed his side really hard, she whispered hesitantly. We're tired of the sweets you left at the altar, and would like different ones. When I asked what they wanted, her eyes lit up like a child. Oh, I want whatever's popular now. I'm okay with what we have now, my father muttered. But he fell silent again after my mother elbowed him once more. When I pressed her for a more concrete answer, my mother replied, Oh, I'll leave it up to you. But I don't want to lose to Nanny Nanny Chan. I couldn't understand what she said. I asked her what she meant, and apparently, amongst the spirits of the dead, they took great pride in the offerings they received. It seemed my competitive mother had taken a blow to her ego. This year I want to win, she half cried. So I gave her the caramels I got as a souvenir from my friend. Although, to be honest, I think caramels had already passed their prime. But now, every year when we meet, each conversation starts with this year, how would you like? Even in death, my parents are rather carefree. Obon takes place during the height of summer and is a popular time for kids to try kimo dameshi or tests of courage. There's no better way to cool down during the hot and humid summer months than scaring yourself silly, and it's popular with young kids all the way up to adults. This next story is about a young man who helps organize a test of courage for the local children at a nearby temple. But what happens when one of the children goes missing? This one's called, He saw his dead father during a test of courage. On this particular day, the Children's Association was holding a test of courage for the kids at A's temple. And as part of the Young Persons Association, both A and I participated as helpers. Akemi-san and I were to play the ghost roles. Akemi-san was Yuta-kun's mother. Her husband had passed away in a car accident she wore white clothing and drew a line of blood from her mouth. Getting into the role, she opened up her kimono a little and said, This way really sets the mood, don't you think? Akemi-san was in her late twenties. The whole look was very risque and both A and I fell for it. Taking some mosquito coils and a torch, we went to our own places. A told the kids some scary stories, and then finally the test began. I could hear the sounds of children crying and screaming from far away, each time Akemi-san jumped out to scare them. Just as I was finished with the last group, Akemi-san came over. Did Yuta cry? Come to think of it, I realized Yuta-kun hadn't come, and I turned pale. I didn't see him. What? But he passed by me. Confused, we went back, but Yuta-kun wasn't there. We ran and searched the entire course, but he wasn't anywhere. Akemi-san was half crying. When we got back to the temple, however, A was holding Yuta-kun. We were relieved. 
Crying, Akemi-san asked Yutakun what happened. When I passed you, Daddy was there. So we talked. According to A, I heard voices behind the main building. So I went and had a look, and Yuta was sleeping there. Yuta, what did Daddy say? Um, he said to take care of you. Akemi burst out crying at those words. Well, it is Obon. He probably came to see if Yuta is being a good boy or not. A said. No. Daddy said he was going to get revenge. We all froze. A few weeks later, I heard that the company of the assailant that had killed Yuta's father in the accident had finally been forced to pay back all the damages they had been holding off on. From the bottom of my heart, I wish him happiness in the next world. Obon season sees a lot of movement throughout Japan, as people return to their family homes and have reunions with brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles and cousins they haven't seen for quite some time. This next story is about a young man who returned to his grandparents' house in the countryside for Obon and the terrifying thing that happened to him and his cousin as they played in the nearby mountains. This one's called The Fear I Felt at the Mountain with My Cousin. More than 20 years have passed. I was in the lower grades of elementary school at the time. My family returned to the lush green fields of the countryside for Obon. With a bug net in hand, I ran around catching bugs with my cousin. He was the same age as me, and I hadn't seen him in a long time. There was this sense of space that you couldn't get in the big cities. Before we knew it, we were standing before the mountain behind our grandfather's place. There are probably some really big bugs up there. Yeah, what are we going to do if they don't fit in the net? Putting aside mutation, it was highly unlikely there would be such bugs, but the mountain was overflowing with life, so we held high expectations. The two of us ran around for a while, but suddenly my cousin stopped. Ah, uh, sorry. I need to go to the toilet. I didn't know why he was apologizing, but he looked upset about it. You want to go back? No. Oh, I can't hold it any longer. He crouched down in some nearby bushes and pulled down his pants. I could imagine from the sound just how much liquid was there. So I turned around and started playing with the pockets of my pants. I was raised well, so there were tissues in my pocket, but I wasn't sure whether it would be enough. While considering such thoughts, a scream rose behind me that didn't sound like anything on this earth. What's wrong? Pushing his way through the grass with his pants halfway up, my cousin looked at me with a terrifying expression on his face. His hands and feet were covered in soft, squishy red things. They were leeches. They're not especially rare in the countryside, but they were unknown to a city kid. Of course, we were just elementary school kids, so we didn't know anything about them or what to do. Oh, hurry up! Flick them off! I timidly held out a tissue for him. He reached out and grabbed it, but instead of wiping off the leeches, he wiped his backside once, twice, 
and then took off his pants and underwear. From his ankles to his feet, he was covered in dark red leeches, like a spotted pattern. He was absorbed in trying to get them off, but they were too strong and not going anywhere. Lines of blood painted his lower half. He looked like some kind of undiscovered monster. <laughs> Help me! He screamed out in panic. Seeing his naked lower half exposed and coming at me, I felt incredible fear. I screamed and ran away from my cousin-turned-monster down the mountain path, heading towards our grandfather's house. On the way, I turned around several times. My cousin continued to chase me, with the leeches dangling from his naked lower half. All I could think about at the time was how my cousin had become one with the leeches and would change me into a leech person too. Mom! Dad! I dove into the entranceway half crying. While calling out for my parents, I went to take off my sandals and then I realized my feet were covered in leeches too. Was I going to become a leech man like my cousin as well? I cried. I took my sandals off while crying and ran into the hall looking for an adult. Then I heard a female voice scream out behind me. It was my mother's voice. I did a U-turn so I could go back to her and then screamed myself. There was a line of small footprints on the floor. They weren't just any footprints. They were the color of blood. Was I being chased by some kind of monster? Something behind me that I couldn't see was leaving bloody footprints while chasing me. I cut through the guest room and the Japanese style room looking for the adults, continuing my escape from the monster I couldn't see. Of course, it was clearly evident that they were my own footprints, but at the time I didn't notice, and it just accelerated my own panic. I ran around the house, leaving tiny bloody footprints behind me wherever I went. My grandfather's house was huge, but, of course, they heard all the noise, and my uncle and aunt found me. My aunt clung to me, while my uncle screamed out, Lida! Lida! My mother screamed in the entranceway for the second time. I was surrounded by confused relatives. As we passed through the blood-covered hallway, my mother was in the entranceway with my wailing cousin. The sight of my cousin covered in blood and leeches stirred up even our relatives who lived out in the countryside. As our uncle and grandfather started to burn them, the leeches that had clung so tight dropped off in a funny manner. They took my cousin's shirt off, and while he was standing in the entranceway naked, the adults thoroughly inspected his whole body for leeches. Without leaving a single one behind, they all fell off. The adults stood on them as they dropped, and they were washed away with hot water. But my feet and my cousin's body continued to bleed. Even when they put on ointment, the blood didn't stop. An ambulance was called, and along with our parents, we went to the hospital. When you're bitten by a leech, there's no pain but they secrete a substance to stop your blood from coagulating, so it becomes difficult to stop it. After that, an annoying itch continued on and on. This soon calmed down after they applied some ointment. I was okay, but my cousin was bitten all over, and taking into account his small size, and how much blood they took, he was kept overnight on a drip. His father decided to stay with him. In his hospital room, he was covered head to toe in bandages, and his face was somewhat blue. I'm sorry. 
Without saying exactly why, I lowered my head. Thanks for the paper, my cousin said. Ah, he was talking about the tissue paper. As we left the room, there were two policemen standing there. I don't know who called them. I told them all about how we went up to the mountain to catch bugs, and how he went to poop in the woods, then got covered in leeches, the mysterious thing that chased us at home, and then the adults searching my cousin's naked body for all the leeches. The next day, my grandfather and people from the local area went up to the mountain with their grass cutting tools and cut away all the grass. Then it was all sprayed with chemicals. The strange smell even reached my grandfather's house. In the end, my cousin was in the hospital for two weeks. There was the fact he wouldn't stop bleeding, but they also checked him for various infections. When we returned from the countryside to the city, my parents also took me to the hospital to be checked over. At the time, I was more bothered by the needles than any infection. When I saw my cousin again the next year, we certainly didn't feel like going to catch any bugs, and we most certainly didn't go near the mountain. A while later, our grandfather passed away and left his house to my cousin. I heard that, besides work, he's also studying leeches. He's probably using that experience to help protect people from the harm of leeches. Or, so I thought. But, according to my father, the damage done by leeches in that area has been rapidly increasing. I don't have any solid numbers, but I have a real feeling that since my cousin moved there, the number of leeches has begun to increase. Just what the hell is he studying? Our last story for this week is about a grandmother who claims to see people around the house and hear sounds coming from upstairs. The first Obon holiday after she passes, however, reveals that she perhaps wasn't as senile as the family thought she was. This one's called Closet on the Second Floor. I don't believe in ghosts at all, but this story is about one such single experience I had. I think I was about 20 years old. My grandmother was starting to go senile. She started saying things like, someone came to see her during the day, or strangers were calling her on the phone. When we took her to the hospital, it turned out to be complications from Alzheimer's. Gradually, things got worse, as did the things she said. In particular, she started to say things like, there's someone upstairs, a lot more frequently. However, when we would go upstairs to investigate, there was, of course, no evidence anyone had been there. The family and I could do nothing but pretend not to hear it. Then my grandmother became bedridden. One day she was taken to the hospital by an ambulance, and a week later she passed away. She was 84 years old. I'll never forget what happened the next year, on August 15th. I was on holidays for Obon, and for some reason, was giving the house a big clean. At the time, only my mother and I were home. My mother was outside, hanging out the washing. So, while I was cleaning, I heard this sound 
coming from the room my mother and older sister sleep in. At first, I thought perhaps my mother was doing something upstairs, so I didn't think much of it. But gradually, the sound got louder and louder. Then I heard my mother laughing and chatting with someone from the neighborhood outside. I was covered in sweat from all the cleaning. Huh? Who's making that sound upstairs then? I thought. I went up to the second floor. I thought maybe my sister was back and also doing some cleaning. I made for the room the sound was coming from. Even though I could hear the as I reached the top of the stairs, as soon as I entered the room, it fell silent. Sis, are you doing some cleaning? As I said this, the small closet started to move. Thinking my sister was inside, I went to open it. Even now I can't forget the shock that awaited me. When I opened the small closet at my feet, I heard the kya, kya, laughing voices of small children. I was confused. I got down on my knees and inside I saw three children, around four or five years old, packed in there eating something. One of them was a girl with a short bob cut. The other two were boys with shaved heads. The three of them were extremely dirty and smelly. What's more, the three of them were looking right at me with big smiles. When I realized, I took off running downstairs. I ran outside barefoot to find my mother. When I came running outside barefoot and pale-faced, my mother was surprised. But when I explained everything to her, she just went, Huh? And went inside. For a while, I couldn't move. My heart was racing so furiously, I could hear it beating on and on and on. A little while later, my mother came back outside. Apparently, there was nothing there. She just said that inside the closet was extremely smelly. That was the first and last time I saw the things that looked like the ghosts of children. But my dead grandmother often said, there's something upstairs. So I'm not sure if that was somehow related. Did they appear because it was Obon? That house was knocked down, so it's not around anymore. I still can't forget that smell, however. It was like the smell of someone who hadn't taken a bath for a month. I wonder if they were the spirits of children who died in the war. Even now when I go to open a closet, I have to summon up all of my courage. And that brings us to the end of this week's episode. Don't forget, you can follow us on Twitter or Facebook for more news and updates throughout the week. Or join our Patreon for early access to both this show and Toshiden, exploring Japanese urban legends, as well as special bonus episodes you won't get anywhere else. Head over to koabana.net for all those links. And thank you once again for joining us on Koabana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. Want even more scary stories? Head over to koabana.net for new translations every week. You can also join our Patreon for exclusive stories you won't find anywhere else. Head over to koabana.net now.